You're listening to the Quality Speak Weekly podcast. 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 Yeah, but with that, uh, we want to transition to a little bit of Milo Talk still and um, the CPAC convention that, that's going on. Now, for those of you who don't know, you've probably heard of CPAC and it's uh, kind of an important kind of thing for conservatives. Uh, and it's been around for a good little while now. It has its roots going back to uh, the 1964 loss of presidential uh, nominee Barry Goldwater. Uh, and that's kind of when the American Conservative Union was kind of born and kind of pushing ideas of conservatism. So essentially, uh, almost kind of in the position where where the kind of the Democrats are, in a sense, it's one of their biggest Republican defeats. And they were kind of rebuilding to kind of push their core uh, message, which which took a long time. And over the past kind of two or three election cycles, this CPAC thing has been uh, kind of growing and growing. And it's an interesting story because the CPAC convention always does a straw poll for uh, president when the election cycle is going on. And this last year, actually, Ted Cruz won it uh, by a good good margin. But one thing to note about CPAC, and this kind of ties into our last segment, is that uh, Milo was actually going to be one of their featured speakers, and they wanted him there because of some of the things we talked about in the last uh, segment about Milo's voice in the conservative party and how it's kind of drawing a much younger crowd. Because I know conservatives uh, in, in their early 30s, late 20s, and I know conservatives of family members and friends who are far older and, you know, even up to their 60s and 70s. And there's a very different view of Milo from both of these people. Uh, and we'll just talk about right before all of this went down, the youth people are kind of more open to his style of kind of pissing people off. And, and the older conservatives are kind of taken aback, rightfully so. Now it seems that they were right the whole time about this. Uh, but he was actually disinvited from CPAC, uh, which is an interesting story on itself. And then what just happened earlier today, right before we started recording this, uh, that I wanted to note is that Richard Spencer, who we also talked about a little bit in the last segment, was booted from CPAC because he was there uh, doing this whole thing. So conservatives aren't having the greatest couple of days here going into their main convention. Uh, when you have to get rid of two men for two very different reasons. And it's just, it's to me, it's just so funny that, like, this is the one convention where you, the core of the of conservatism is out and out there and, and Republican pride and, you know, bring back family values. And the two people uh, that you end up getting rid of and disinviting are kind of shitty, shitty people. We should clarify that Milo was, you know, actually invited as a keynote speaker, whereas Richard Spencer was was just trying to be a, you know, be one of the many attendees. I, I he was ju- he was just there and he had a big scene and they ended up asking him to get the hell out. Yeah, even though he surely has a certain segment of people there who aren't that hostile to his message. I mean, Bannon was there addressing them. Uh, I believe that was today. So there, there's, there is crossover there between the, uh, there's not that much distance, I guess I should say between the message of Spencer and the message of Bannon. Uh, I think Spencer is just a lot more provocative about it. But again, unlike Milo, both Spencer and Bannon have a, a, I think a much more shaped worldview and a worldview that's really toxic. Um, So I, I can't imagine there's that much distance there. And there surely are people at CPAC who, probably don't mind Spencer that much, just like there were a lot of people who were excited to see Milo. And then, I mean, and and it should be noted that CPAC has had a lot of issues in the past. I know a lot of leftist uh, websites and stuff have been picking up on this. And I mean, rightfully so to a a great extent, but even uh, CPAC has had several issues going back to uh, Ann Coulter using uh, that uh, homophobic slur during her uh, speech back in 07, to describe uh, John Edwards, who was still a candidate, who ended up being a, one of the worst goddamn human beings on earth after everything came out. God, he's a terrible shit person. Um, but they had, in 2011, uh, a gay Republicans group called uh, uh, GOP Proud was one of the kind of official co-sponsors of CPAC. 
Um, and that prompted a boycott from some other major sponsors who objected to uh, their message. Um, and a year later, GOP Proud's request to be a sponsor was denied. So they've had kind of an interesting back and forth with controversies and also with uh, President Trump himself. Uh, even in 2015, Trump went to the conference and um, there was some audible boos that he received when he was up there speaking, uh, especially when he was referring to using uh, ground troops to combat ISIS. Um, and then in, in 2016, this last year, he was scheduled to speak but dropped out uh, choosing to to campaign instead. So CPAC is it's an interesting kind of kind of smorgasbord of conservatism that doesn't I don't know if it knows what it is anymore because it's transformed so much in the decades of since it was created yeah I mean I was actually I was just about to transition to that that they I mean they do the the straw poll every every year and I believe Rand Paul was or Ted Cruz won last year but I think it was Rand Paul three years in a row before that and there had been that whole kind of libertarian yeah yeah Ron Ron Paul as well and there had been that whole really overhyped libertarian moment which a lot of us on the right and left uh, saw to just be you know built on sand and in fact about about three years ago, Kevin Williamson, who I whose columns I usually don't recommend, in fact I'm quite hot, quite hostile to over at National Review, wrote a great, great piece about why you know the libertarian moment wasn't really going to manifest itself, why it was doomed, and it's just because most Americans aren't libertarians. <laughs> on, on on the right and left, most people just aren't libertarian uh, in, in in various ways. Yeah, he won. Rand Paul won three years in a row: 2013, 14, and 15. And his dad won in 10 and 11. Mitt Romney won in 12, the year, of course, where uh, he was running. Yeah. So it's. I think he, I think he, I think Mitt Romney also ran in 2007. So it's, I mean, I think he also. Yeah, when, when he was running, yeah, I'm looking at the numbers. He won in 07, 08, and 09. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. That's an even better showing. So, yeah. So th that kind of shows that you, you do have a, something of a diverse array of, you know, kind of more business class, uh, economically conservative Republicans, some, you know, more philosophically libertarian types. It's an interesting list. If you go back to the winners of, uh, Rand Paul has the most, I believe who has the Mitt Romney won three times, Rand Paul won three times, Jack Kemp won three times, Ronald Reagan won three times, Mitt Romney won four times with a spread in between. So <laughs> Mitt Romney is their most loved candidate. Rudy Giuliani won it in 05, George Allen in six. Like some of these people, even people into politics to keeping up with them wouldn't even know who they are. Steve Forbes, Gary Bauer. Man, it's an interesting list. <laughs> Yeah, Gary Bauer is a flash of the past, I guess, to some degree. So is Steve Forbes. But it's worth noting, too, that when Donald Trump – and I, I remember this, and I, I remember his speech then. I remember watching it, the 2011 one. Uh, he, you know, he was very, very favorably received, and he gave a speech uh, that, as many are noting now, was, was not – that at all different from what he's saying. So there, 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 there was kind of uh, a receptiveness to his populist nationalism. But then the 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 other side of this too is the fact that Milo, who does, who is someone without a really an ideology or meaning, someone who's just this kind of provocator and celebrity was was going to be the keynote speaker. Uh, you you have Ken Bone there this week. Ken Bone, um, many will recall, was I had almost forgot about him. Yeah, mercifully, uh, he was at the I believe it was the second debate. He was the big lovable guy in the red sweater who asked I think some really kind of a name question about clean energy if i'm remembering correctly something something about energy or solar or something but he became a, a living meme just because of who he was like not his message or anything he was just a funny guy that the internet took over yeah with his mustache and everything and you know someone who was undecided at that point 
is just a moron. I mean, you're dealing, I mean, you're dealing with the starkest contrast that you possibly could between candidates as, as far as like, right. But if you didn't know by then, so yeah, you're either lying or you're the most naive person on the planet. Yeah. So I never really understood why. Yeah. I mean, he was like likable for a couple of weeks, maybe. Maybe even that. I wasn't even. I was gonna say for like the couple minutes that after you'd like seen him and then he was down. And you go, oh, that was you know. Yeah, and and here we are. And another thing on Ken Bone, I, I, I throw in is he maybe he said at CPAC, and I haven't seen his speech yet, but he has been pretty adamant about refusing to say who he voted for, which is like. To me, you don't have that right. You asked a question on live TV in front of the whole nation. Like, don't be coy. Like, you clearly voted for one of them. I assume you voted for Trump. And then it's... If you're at CPAC, it would make sense. <laughs> right. But this just goes to a deeper problem with CPAC. That just this emphasis on celebrity. I mean, Ann Coulter in, in 2007, Ann Coulter, who's someone who now really is aggressively hawking a white nationalist message. Um, Ken Bone, Milo, you just, there's just not a lot of substance there. CPAC used to be something that was important, but, and, and I kind of liken it to like a comic book convention now, because what I do in my life and in my job is I go to so many of these conventions, whether Comic Con or video game conventions or tech conventions or, you know, these sort of big events. Uh, and CPAC itself has morphed into just this weird kind of event that has lost its intent and what it was meant to do. I mean, when you have when you go to to these conventions like I do like a comic and people are dressed up and it's kind of this wild party more than anything and now when you go to CPAC and you see pictures coming out of like years ago when there was a guy like in a dolphin suit who called himself Flip Romney you know mocking mocking Mitt Romney for flip-flopping and stuff and you see uh Sarah Palin impersonators and you and you see like a half a dozen cardboard cutouts of like Rand Paul you can take your picture with it's just like this has become their convention of celebrities and and stuff as opposed to where anything meaningful gets done or discussed in earnest. (laughs) (laughs) And I think this is like the next big, just like comic convention, but for conservatives, you just, you know, when you literally, when you guys have someone dressed up as like flipper for God's sakes and cutouts of where you could stand next to Rand Paul, you may not have any idea what you're doing anymore. (laughs) But that's clearly is the case with the Republican Party and the, you know, the Republican Party actually being something semi distinct from the conservative movement, but really not that distinct and especially not at this point. I mean, certainly it's a it's all it's a great look into the Republican Party, how weird and white and diverse and off kilter and how not together it really is. I mean, it's there's a bunch of weird stuff going on there. No, absolutely. I mean, including there was a w- one of the forum discussions was apparently a uh, based on the premise that heaven has a big gate and extreme vetting, so why can't we, which is just I mean, a, that's not a joke. That's a real like panel they had. Yeah, no, it is. And I, I saw it online and I actually it's and it, you can have that panel at a comic con like right next to like who's better, the Riddler or the Joker. And then the next one is like, if you can get into heaven, why can't you know, we have a gate too. it's literally some the, the kind of things you would see at a comic convention where a bunch of crazy people together get and put some stupid thing together, like which is the best magic the gathering card. Let's talk about it for four hours. Right, and I'm I'm not even an atheist or someone with like a like a really extreme outsized hostility to religion or even religion to some degree in the public square. I'm not someone who loses a lot of sleep over all that. But I don't know what the rest of us in a pluralistic democracy are supposed to make of that. Like I just I don't I don't know what to do with that information. Like I, I don't know how that's instructive to policy. But that's that's CPAC. I mean there's just been I think CPAC perfectly encapsulates now this just continuing not just 
fascination with celebrity, hence uh, Donald Trump, who we should say is the first Republican president since Ronald Reagan to visit CPAC in his first term. So I believe that's happening tomorrow. So that's that's big. Mike Pence addressed them today, uh, vice president, but also just anti-expertise and, and they're, they're just anti-intellectualism. I mean, you had Sarah Palin who kind of captures both where she is a celebrity and she's just a really, really empty, nasty person. Uh, but she has no facts to get. I mean, there, there's no there, there's no concept that Sarah Palin can illuminate. And this is just the broader conservative movement generally, where you look at their Fox News lineup, and there and I, this isn't just liberal bashing of Republicans. I mean, there are, there are a lot of conservatives. I mean, David Frum. Uh, to, to, to name but one of them. There, there are a lot of conservatives who are reasonably thoughtful people, even where you might disagree with them strenuously. Like there, there are Republicans worth listening to, but the, the biggest voices, the loudest voices who get the most attention on Fox News, I mean, Sean Hannity. I mean, Sean Hannity, who's not an expert in anything and isn't even clever at and he's not even good at his own job. And there, there's no, there's no, there's no spin that he has. I mean, Bill O'Reilly has some modicum of journalistic talent, and he at least has something of a. It's an often racist and obnoxious and pseudo populist shtick, but it's an actual shtick, and it's like in something of a. It's something. And Sean Hannity just doesn't have any of that. And there's just so frequently in the conservative world now, these people who really don't seem to have, you know, sometimes there's, they're, you know, they were like Glenn Beck in the Obama era where they clearly had this like kind of, and they had this like kind of bonkers, batshit broadcasting talent. But Glenn Beck did. <laughs> With all <laughs> Glenn Beck. Now I'm remembering all his like panels and his chalkboards and his insanity. No, it was it was insane. But Glenn Beck actually did have something of like a kind of maniacal sort of broadcasting that there was some sort of presence there that Sean Hannity, who I believe is their biggest ratings getter, just doesn't have. And he doesn't have any IQ points to go with it. I mean, Sean Hannity's just a moron. There's there's no reason. He's, he's an idiot. At least Glenn Beck was entertaining. <laughs> At the very least. Yeah. And then, he was like a reject, like Batman villain that got a TV show. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And uh, that, that's, that's spot on. But Glenn Beck could also be funny. I mean, Glenn Beck. Right. He's, he's legitimately at times when he was making points or, or being stupid, he was funny. But we just see this time and time after again. And I, th- there is some of this on the left too, but I think it's to a lot lesser of a degree. And I think, I think some of it is just the natural tilt in the, in the liberal world where, you know, academia and especially certain parts of the media and the sciences really do skew left. So I think, I think a lot of the anti-intellectualism, some of which is there is, is kind of held back a little in a way that it's not in the conservative world, but you just have time and time after again, I mean, there's Sarah Palin and, and her elevation. And then I mean, who could forget in the 2008 presidential campaign, Joe, the plumber who was a guy who really didn't, you know, he had ambitions, which were laudable to, to own his own business and, and all that, but he wasn't someone with, much of anything else going on but because he had the nerve to approach obama and kind of forcefully ask him a question he became a celebrity in the conservative world you even had more recently this young kid named cj pearson who's like 13 still years away from being able to vote who you would see conservatives sharing his post on social media. And I, I, I think he's even had his his thoughts published maybe even in Time magazine, if memory is serving me uh, right now. And I just I don't see the equivalent of that on, on the left. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just I can't uh, I just can't really think of an instance or conceive of a time when liberals would be looking to a a teenager or someone even younger to make their points for them. But that's, 
that's the conservative world. <laughs> they're, 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 and it kind of ties back to this, uh, Milo, just a little bit in that they're looking for that youth base and they're, and they're looking to be kind of not seen as this old curmudgeon party anymore. And I think a lot of that has, has to do with that. But CPAC is, it's interesting. I'm sure we'll have some more to talk about next week on the subject after uh, President Trump speaks tomorrow uh hopefully fingers crossed he doesn't use a teleprompter or anything because when he starts to go off uh, things tend to get inter- 